that. So thank you for sharing your perspectives and, uh, and approach on that. Moving on, our final speaker is a uh, noted author, media commentator, and a globally recognized leader in philanthropy, education, talent development, and public policy. He co-founded the Washington DC-based Institute for Higher Education Policy, and he's currently the president and CEO of the Lumina Foundation. Please join me in welcoming Jamie Marisotis to the forum. Well, thank you very much, Jay, and I'm uh, delighted to be with you and I uh, want to add my thanks uh, to Stevens, to Chami for the invitation. I'm really delighted to be a part of this forum and uh, uh, I want to offer perhaps um, less summative comments than what uh, Stephen and Kathy offered, which were just excellent, and maybe some forward-looking uh, concluding comments about where the future of learning fits, really when it comes to our desire as humans to work. Uh, human work the work that only humans can do is the work of the future, not the future of work as you hear people uh, probably more commonly say. Now, I make this distinction because future of work, uh, between future of work and work of the future, not because I wanna quibble, but because I think we have to acknowledge that the very notion of work itself matters. And I think when people say future of work, I worry that at least some of them are questioning the basic idea of work and people's desire to do it. And I think, I think they're wrong. Now, I can't pretend to have read even a fraction of what were, are now probably thousands of books and reports on the future of work, but I have read enough to tell you that most are in what I call the robot zombie apocalypse camp. You see, in most of these books and articles, the dominant narrative about the future of work is one of massive job loss fueled by rapid advances in AI, mainly in developed countries. You know, a report from Oxford said that 47% of jobs are at high risk of automation in this decade. And a, and a McKinsey report said 800 million jobs worldwide could be automated in the next 10 years. Now, these and many other claims about the coming loss of jobs have become so popular that the MIT Technology Review actually published a scorecard of the range of estimates in all of the different scientific studies. And what they concluded, not surprisingly, is that they vary dramatically. In other words, we have no idea how many jobs will actually be lost globally to technology or any of the other changes occurring to work. Indeed, I think there's a lot of evidence to support the view that technology might create millions of new jobs. Technology has always created many more jobs than it destroys, and my view is that the same may be true in the future. But that doesn't mean that things are not different this time because they are different. And I think we need to pay attention to how and why they're different. So, Let's start to break this down by looking at what's already happened to jobs in the US, where I'm from, and around the world. Now, for decades, the OECD has shown that we've seen an enormous increase in the demand for skills across all occupations. And here in the US, the shift was accelerated by the Great Recession and its aftermath. And it's accelerating again today due to the pandemic and the rapid recession that's, uh, that's followed. Uh, the most obvious impact of this shift has been an increase in the value of degrees. More than 5 million jobs for Americans with a high school education or less disappeared in 2008 and 2009, and they never came back. Yet those jobs requiring a bachelor's degree actually went up during the recession and have exploded since, and indeed are doing so right now uh, during the pandemic. Uh, strange as it sounds, you know, I think in some ways the wage premium for college and university graduates is now possibly too high because it's become a major cause of the growth of income inequality. We like to think that higher education reduces inequality and increases economic and social mobility, but sadly this is no longer the case because really only those people with a degree are benefiting from today's employment market and not everyone has the opportunity to get a degree. Now, most of the conversations about the so-called future of work that I've been part of in recent years have largely overlooked or understated how less skilled workers are disproportionately impacted. For example, a recent Brookings Institution report found that 53 million American workers, about 44% of all US workers, earn less than 11 US dollars per hour. Now add in the disproportionate impact we've seen of COVID-19 on these same populations, those working in uh, hospitality and retail and other less skilled fields. And you can see how the prospects look grim for those without talent developed in the post high school learning context. 
So let's talk now about the real work of the future. Work is and always has been about more than making a living. Because only talking about money and financial security, I think fundamentally misses what people want from work. A human work, simply stated, is work in which the people performing it are actively engaged in responding to their environment. Because the landscape for human work is dynamic, it isn't repetitive, and it's much more difficult to automate. AI gives machines the ability to learn through repetition, but the harder it is to discern patterns and nuance, the more likely it is humans will be needed to do it. The most unpredictable environments are those created by other humans, which is why so much human work involves interacting with people. Human work is rooted in our intelligence, our drive, and our values, all things that are different than what machines possess. And human work is driven by how we learn. Much of the progress in robotics and AI in recent years is based on the development of deep learning, a technique in which computers learn through algorithms that methodically drill down into larger data sets. But humans learn in very different ways, what I call as a contrast to this idea of deep learning, the notion of wide learning. Now, one dimension of wide learning is time. This has come up in the, in the conversation already. The notion that learning must take place in a wide time context over the course of people's entire lifetime, I think is essential to human work. It's a virtuous cycle that has to be repeated many times over a worker's life cycle, not simply once early in life. The second dimension of wide learning is the people doing the learning. Human work must serve a wide range of people, diverse in terms of race, ethnicity, gender, immigration status, and a host of other factors. Human workers must reflect the totality of society for all of us to share in the benefits of their human work. And the third dimension is the content of the learning. What people must learn to be successful in the human work ecosystem represents a wide array of human traits and capabilities. People learn in wide ways as a pathway to work, not only because it helps them economically, but also because it offers them social mobility, personal satisfaction, and frankly, a range of other rewards that are almost impossible to describe. Now make no mistake about it, being paid for work, making a living also really matters. But for most people, work represents something more. When the opportunity to do meaningful work is taken away, people suffer and our communities and nations grow weaker. Most workers say that having real meaning in their work is essential to happiness and life satisfaction. Indeed, research shows that even low income workers are willing to trade off some money if it means greater happiness and fulfillment, contributing to a greater whole. Now, one of the key things I learned from the nearly two dozen real workers who I profiled in my new book on human work is that we must develop both their human traits, things like empathy, ethics, and compassion, and their human capabilities, things like creativity and problem solving, analysis and communication. Developing these traits and capabilities will be critical in an environment where we have existential threats from pandemics and threats to democracy that are accelerated by technology. Work will demand that many more people develop these traits and capabilities because we face an era where we need to cut through narrow viewpoints and misleading information to make sense of complex issues. The cascading failure in the US of COVID-19, driven by false information about the virus and its prevention and fueled by authoritarian opportunism is a sad and very current example of this. Authoritarianism, particularly in the form of populist nationalism, has of course returned with a vengeance to many parts of the world and we know that no nation is immune. Of course, much of that allure is driven by fear, fear of change, fear of loss of advantage, fear of the other. Research on authoritarianism supports the idea that individuals who have a greater preference for group cohesion are more inclined to feel threatened by diversity, be intolerant of outsiders, and re react by supporting authoritarian leaders. For example, according to the most recent World Values Survey, the younger generation in many developed countries are wary of democracy and are more open to authoritarian ideas, such as military rule or so-called strongman leaders, as long as they deliver. But this changes significantly when you break the data down by level of education. In the US, for example, a third of Americans who haven't gone to college believe that having a quote, strong leader is good for the country compared to only about 13% of those with a bachelor's degree. 
In the end, the greatest contribution of a better educated population to shared prosperity is that educated citizens are the best defense against the threats to our democratic way of life. So what we need to do is cultivate critical thinking and ethical decision-making and, and analytic reasoning, all the things that Jeanette was talking about earlier, lots of the other democracy enhancing traits and capabilities in vastly more people. Clearly the skills needed for human work in the future are the same ones we need to escape the dangerous trajectory we're on in society locally and globally. Well, I think this brings us back to the beginning the changes we've seen in work so far have been dramatic. And as I said, it's likely even bigger changes are in store for us, accelerated by COVID, by the urgency of achieving racial and social justice, and by the profound sense that in a world of cascading societal failure, we must return to who we are as humans, to better connect to each other and to ourselves in this time of crisis and for what comes next. And as I've examined the implications of human work in coming times, I've concluded that re rather than representing the end of work, the work of the future will draw on our unique abilities. Our challenge as a society is to assure that everyone has the opportunity to develop their own unique abilities throughout their lives. That means developing our traits and capabilities, not only to prepare us for jobs, but to prepare us for a new form of active citizenship. This will ensure that people are positioned for success, not only when it comes to work in the future, but I think just as importantly, it may instill hope and confidence for the overall future of our global society. Thank you, Jay, back to you. Thank you, Jamie. That was a, a terrific uh, summary of what we've talked about today and how we go forward in the future. And you know, quite frankly, some of the stuff you brought up is quite sobering, right? It can get very exciting to talk about technology and using it, but again, so we talk about populism or the educational levels of the world that's realistic and we have to keep that in mind as we considering as we consider how to make profound change in learning so thank you for that thank you well said